Greetings, and thanks for joining us for this conversation with the creators and cast of HBO Max's Search Party. My name is Nick McCarthy, and I'm the director of programming at NewFest, New York's leading LGBTQ film and media organization. We were delighted to provide an advanced screening of episodes seven and eight of season four for our audiences, and are even more excited for this panel conversations with the brilliant creative minds behind the show, both behind and in front of the camera. Uh, we've been fans of this chameleon-like series since the beginning, and we're not surprised to see season four continue to morph into a variety of genres with a brilliant grasp of craft and a singular sense of sly humor. Uh, we'd like to thank our friends and partners at HBO Max for their commitment to queer storytelling and for making this conversation possible. Uh, also, if you haven't caught up, please, you can stream all four seasons of Search Party on HBO Max right now, or you can rewatch them right now because I've done twice already. Uh, today's conversation will be moderated by Kevin Fallon, who is the senior entertainment reporter at The Daily Beast. So please join me in welcoming Kevin Fallon. Hi, hi everyone, thanks Nick. I'm so excited to get to talk to the mad geniuses behind Search Party, one of the coolest, most unique and adventurous shows on television. But of course, you all don't need me to tell you that because you're watching this here, you already love them. So let's just get into it with the people behind that mad genius, the cast and creators of Search Party. I'd like to first welcome Alia Shawcat, who plays Dory Seif and is producer. We have John Reynolds, who plays Drew Gardner. We have Meredith Hagner, who plays Portia Davenport. Cole Escala, who plays Chip. Charles Rogers, the co-creator and executive producer. And Sarah Violet Bliss, co-creator and executive producer. It's so nice to see all of you and to see all of you alive <laughs> after that finale. <laughs> yeah, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously this show goes to some really dark places this season and also takes up its biggest comedy swings. Um, so I was wondering if maybe some of the cast could talk about what the reaction was when they saw how far things were gonna go uh, in, in the season four. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, each season before, as, as it's being written, um, Charles and SV kind of give um, us a little sense of where it's going. And uh, I remember when we were shooting season three, them kind of talking about um, this idea. Um, and it sounded, you know, very extreme and surreal as every season <laughs> kind of does. And um, I think they, they just always do such an amazing job of like meeting uh, the expectations. Um, but yeah, I think I was a little scared, but in a excited way to, to play someone who's tortured on a daily basis. <laughs> um, I was very excited to um, to be kind of like team partnered um, with Cole. Um, I think the character that they created is so great and it was really, really fun to, you know, I miss being with the core group, but um, I feel like we created something really, you know, special and, and unique and, and that was really fun. Yeah, yeah. it's funny. That I oh, go ahead, John. I guess I'll talk. Uh, yeah, and for me being in the core group, uh, you know, it felt sort of like we were in Scooby Doo almost, like while Ali was going through like misery, where it was more uh, cartoonish and cat and mousey and us like chasing around uh, Susan Sarandon. So uh, I think every year for me, I feel like the scripts get campier and zanier, like in a fun way. And sometimes I sort of look back on season one and the episodes are so tense it's kind of um, like hard to watch sometimes. You're like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> like you need a break. <laughs> Meredith's muted. Oh yeah, I think we need, I have to unmute Meredith. There we can go. We, actually, nice can we can we can we keep Meredith muted? <laughs> um, no, I feel like I I feel like I, I say this often, but it's so true. When I when we shot the pilot, if you would have told me where the story goes, I would have been like, you're fucking insane. What? We're just like ch chatting at brunch. Like no one knew what the hell. We we're like, this is fun. And then going to, like for Alia and Cole, especially obviously their story goes to these incredibly, incredibly high stakes and dramatic places. Um, it just is so exciting because that's so rare in television. I feel like that never happens. 
I mean, you just mentioned that brunch scene from the first episode of the series. And it is wild to think about, you know, what that scene was versus where we've gone through these four seasons. You know, as, as actors, are you surprised by what you've been asked to do, but also what you've been able to do as the show has sort of morphed into something different with each season and, and things have gotten so, so dark and so extreme? I mean, it's just, uh, I'll, I'll just stop talking. <laughs> no, it's like, it's such a dream. I mean, without sounding like fake actor on a panel, like, you know, but it is a dream to get to go to these, these places that you think you're on this comedy and then suddenly half the things are these, the writing is just so incredible. Um, yeah, I, I love the feeling of being like, holy shit, can I pull this off? I love that. Um, and that's an exciting, like scary thing. And every season there's a handful of scenes where I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. And and getting to watch Alia, holy shit, your performance this season is insane. Uh, anyway, I'm oh no, we haven't seen each other since we were talking. I feel okay. like um, it's also such a natural progression. Like if you were, yeah, if you were to ask me season one, uh, you know, like, do you think this story would go here? I'd say no. And if you're like, do you think you could pull off the dramatic moments? I'd be like, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, uh, but every year it sort of like slowly gets crazier and it's so natural where it's like, yeah, of course this is where Drew would go. This is where he retreats. Like, of course, yeah, Dory murders like another person, you know, uh, so at no point did it feel weird. Um, and yeah, super lucky that I got to do something dramatic and I'm like, you know, working <laughs> i would say as as one of the creators i would never have expected any of you to be able to, to have pulled any of this off <laughs> um after that i think that there's like a, a creative kind of trust like all every season and it's always like trying to challenge each other and so I think Charles and SV kind of always have this energy of like, yeah, let, let's see if we can do it. You know, um, even since the first season, we were, we were like, what tone is this show? Like, we don't know. We're all doing different stuff. Is it going to connect? And it really did. I, I weirdly watched the first season um, recently for the first time in a while. And I was like, wow, it's like, it's so good. But it's also like, just so, yeah, the, where we've come is, is, is insane. But I do really think it's like a trust and trying to throw stuff at each other creatively and be like, let's see if we can do it. Otherwise, we'd get kind of bored. You know, if we were doing the same like idea of like a millennial looking for somebody else, like that's such an easy, fearful place to go. Like she loses another friend or like whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's gutsy. I don't yeah. think any of us would have, I don't think we would have written how, I, I don't think we would have taken y'all's characters so far if you weren't if you didn't have so much like promise of like at the depths that you guys have like from the beginning you know it's like everyone goes as far as they do because we we want we knew you had that in you and we were like oh it would be so cool to see that happen you know they're also I, we also get like questions like how do you pull the performances out of the actors and i'm like we just cast them we don't have to like do anything i'm not like okay so now to get you prepared to do this like you have to go Just, back to acting school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and in Charles and Sarah Violet, you've obviously pushed to try something new and give each season a different feel and a different tone. And there's all these different references that people can pull from from cinema and and television that sort of inspire the vibe of each new season. Um, I, I think last season it's fair to say that my cousin Vinny and those kind of courtroom comedies were, were a big thing and this, the whole media circus behind Amanda Knox. But then we do a hard pivot this year to Silence of the Lambs and Misery and, and Room. And I was just wondering if you could talk about, you know, how, how you do that, how you turn from these, you know, the black comedy of a courtroom drama like My Cousin Vinny to something as, as, as dark and as serious as Silence of the Lambs and Misery. It's both like it, it it makes our lives easier and harder at the same time and right in like writing and conceiving it because every season we end off in this place where we like paint ourselves into a corner and then have to figure out how to kind of reinvent the most important parts of the show but then it keeps the show evolving 
and I don't think I, I feel like I'm having like a new sense of awareness of all of this now that I'm kind of we're like stepping back from seeing season four, but it's like half intention and then half accident um, along the way. Like it, this whole process has been like, okay, that would be cool. That would be cool. And then now looking back and being like, whoa, that's so interesting that that's what the totality of all those choices is like adding up to. And it does kind of feel like the show has taken on its own form in a weird way where it's, it's changed so much. The thing that we always hold on to is like a through line of meaning for it. And that it's, we've realized as we've made it, that it's really about identity and about denial. And, um, and then we have like a, we try to just say as much as possible about those themes, given all the choices we've made so far. Um, so I think as, as long as we're always like rooting it in, in trying to say like something bigger picture, then like all the kind of flavors that it comes in and out of only helps us make, uh, points creatively, which we did not mean to do necessarily. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's also just fun to find those references that we're pulling from in the, in each season to use to help us in in guiding the genre that we're go- going towards. It just then becomes like, oh, I'm a huge fan of this movie. And ha- how does that help us get to say the themes that we're working with while also using this like language that already exists? Mm-hmm. I'm also curious, after you, you map all of this out where you have these references to these to these very serious movies and you're working on these themes that are quite profound about identity and denial and then you remember that you have to make this really funny um how does how does that factor into all of this oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh your glass eye fell out <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> uh we always say that there's always the first half of putting um ideas up on the board like we step back when we're in the writer's room, we're like, well, this isn't funny at all. Like, cause then it's just like Dory kills someone. They find a key. <laughs> like, it's like, well, this doesn't seem like it's going to be funny, but then we kind of hone in on, okay, well, what's the, we started saying uh, like, what's the search party spin on that idea? You know, if Dory is going to be held in captivity, um, it can't just be in a basement. Um, it's got to be in some like colorful weird version of that idea. So we just keep trying to make decisions that are going to be like interesting to audiences dramatically. And then when you have like the weight of that, then you can kind of like twist them to make them be more the tone of the show. Yeah. And then speaking of things that are like dark and hilarious, there's the twink. Um, I, love the fact that we have a a villain who is referenced in shorthand as the twink um i i imagine that there are both sensitivities to consider but but also sort of a glee and doing something that's a little bit provocative like that and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about and bring cole to this too um you know this idea of the, the twink as a villain and the sort of audaciousness of that kind of humor well the twink I mean, we really didn't know what Chip... I mean, we didn't have even have the name Chip in season three. We just threw up a bunch of ideas in the in the air and we thought it... We knew we really wanted Cole to be this stalker who ends up kidnapping Dory. Um, but in season three, we knew that Chip uh, made dolls, that that would be really fun and that Chip would be a threat. And so beyond that, we kind of had no idea and then we just started to think about cole and what's funny about them and what we would like to see cole do and so from there i i would say with the twink stuff there was never i never felt for a second like this might be sensitive um i think that you know there's there's like aspects to queer culture that are more sensitive to other than others but the the stupidity of a catering service called Twinkies just felt safe. <laughs> so, um, and now Cole, I'd like to bring you in. No, that's okay. Thank you. 
I mean, so when I talked to Sarah Violet and Charles a little bit um, before season four premiered, and they did talk about how this is a kind of character that only Cole could play. And so Cole, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how your sensibilities and the sort of like comic voice that you've honed over these years has sort of filtered its way into Chip, Layla, and, and you know, the, the darkness and, you know, sort of the, that dark underbelly of a character that's otherwise sort of outrageous. Um, I mean, just the, uh, the, the Lila of it all, the Aunt Lila um, character that Chip uh, tries to pass himself off as, as her. Um, sometimes I get intimidated when I read um, scripts and I think, oh, this, like some, this would be better for like a better actor, but then, um, you know, the fact that Chip plays Lila also, I was like, well, it has to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Alia, what was it like playing against Cole as Lila? <laughs> ah, as Lila. Um, I mean, am I answering like as Dory or, I mean, no, please. Um, uh, yeah. I, I mean, that's no, it was, it was it was so fun. I mean, I, I really think the costumes and it just like really came together so well. And um, Cole's Lila was like a whole other character in themselves, you know, um, with, like a lot of gravitas and a little more anger, I think, than Chip, even. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I, it, was, it was really fun to, to play out. I, I think for, for Dory, you know, she's trying to process, like, who this person is. Like, what, what's going on? Like, the first time um, she kind of meets, sees Lila, um, she says something like, do you think people believe that you're, like, an 80-year-old woman? Like, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> And then we also have this running theme of Groove is in the Heart as this sort of song that I always associate with like dancing at a cheesy wedding is now this sort of like theme song to something very dark and twisted that's happening, um, you know, in, in the storyline with Dory and with, with Chip and Lila. Can you talk a little bit about how Groove is in the Heart became, you know, the song that that, that, that works so, so well in those moments? We just, I, there's some stuff that happens in the writer's room where you're never, you, no one's really sure whose idea is. I mean, that's not true. Everyone always knows when it's their own idea, but there's stuff where, <laughs> <laughs> there's stuff where it's the group energy just goes there. And it's, I feel like we just jokingly started seeing Groove is in the Heart. And then two days later, it was like, well, it has to be Groove is in the Heart. That's the only song that we're singing now. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had to kind of campaign Delight to let us use it. Um, and so we wrote them this, uh, message that was like, this is a show with a queer lens, um, about torture. <laughs> Cause I, I got the, we got the sense that like, they might be like, is this just like some Duracell commercial or like, don't just, don't just use our song for anything, you know? And we, we were like, don't worry. It's crazy in a way that we think you would be into. And it also seems like Chip, maybe it got Chip through some hard times. <laughs> have you heard from um, them at all from since they've, have they seen the episodes or anything? Um, no, I, I don't know. I have not heard a peep <laughs> out of delay. <laughs> uh, I also want to talk about um, what might be the sexiest moment in television history, the, the three-way kiss between Drew, Portia, and Elliot. Um, <laughs> can you talk, you know, John and Meredith, a little bit about uh, that scene and the dynamics that sort of led to a very un unpredictable moment? <laughs> yeah. um, I think we were all just having a lot of fun and trying to be funny and be loose. And then through this scene, we started like inching dangerously closer to each other and like it was sort of heading towards a kiss I and think then, I yeah maybe I think, uh, what i'm trying to claim it 
Yeah, maybe you're, maybe you're I, I, I think I started actually, it was definitely me. I can <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, we were sorry, continue. Uh, yeah, and then um, Charles and SV came and gave it that last little nudge and was like, would you guys feel comfortable if you guys kiss? And then we all started laughing and thought it would be very funny. And I was like, yeah, of course, let's absolutely kiss. And um, yeah, then it became sexy and so funny. and. <laughs> It's the talk of the town. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. Those, so many of those, um, those like we missed Alia desperately. Um, now it sounds fucked up, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but, like getting to do the capery stuff and getting to do the dumb loss, like all those feel like we resent her and we kind of hate her and we're forced into looking for her, but it's like all the that just getting to play with John and John and and do dumb shit like that was so fun. I suppose in season three was also fun, but it was like the courtroom drama of it all. So I, yeah. I just segue questions. Well, also <laughs> Meredith, your your drunk falling is incredible. I thought it was a bit broad, yeah, but thank you. No, it, it feels so real. It's mm -hmm. And there's one, when we were in the edit, uh, there was one like, John swings a bottle around just as you fall and it gets this close to your head and SV would laugh at me because I would like like wince every time we would like edit it because you almost killed yourself. Oh god. I know it's the we each play drunk in very different ways and all really all... <laughs> um I also I also want to talk about the um Chantal bottle episode. Um which is so great. And, and as we uh, discussed earlier, Alia, you directed that, um, you know, what was it like to sort of revisit this character from season one, who sort of has existed on the fringes of the series since then, but then you really just dive deep into her psyche and it, and it speaks so much more to, to, you know, the rest of the show and its themes. You know, what was, what was that like to get to, to sort of bring that character's story out and, and, and direct that? Um, it was so fun. I, I was so, so excited um, at the prospect of doing it. Um, I was nervous that I had, you know, was always so used to being uh, just the actor in it. So as involved as I am in the show, I'm still like, I give like notes, but I'm like, all right, but I'm an actor. So I'm going to go back and focus on my own stuff, you know. Um, but in this, I was like, oh, wow, we got to do shot lists. And, you know, it was my first time professionally uh, doing it. So I was nervous at first, but also because I was so close with the crew and Charles and SV are so great and really trusted me. And there was no like them walking around, like being like, careful. They were just kind of like, yeah, you got this. You know, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I got this. Um, but the crew was so great. And Jonathan Fermansky, who's the DP, is really a genius. And so we just worked so well. Like I was like, oh, I already know how we function as a crew so well. And um, being a director is so much fun. Um, you just are like answering questions left and right and <laughs> you get kind of a God complex, but it was great. Um, but also, um, um, you know, uh, Claire McNulty, who, who plays Chantal, it was so fun to get to work with her. I think she's just such a marvelous actress and has such a, a specific kind of vulnerability that is so funny and raw and she just gave me so much. Like she's just, she already was there, you know? So it was really fun as an actress to like work with her and kind of like get to be in the mind of Chantal for a minute, you know, and like really work on those parts. And, and also it's just such a fun episode. It's like so many highs and lows and being on this like talk show set and all the guest actors I got to work with were just like so rad. So every day, and you know, as a side note production wise, I think it's really amazing how much we accomplish on this show. I mean, it's like when you see the episodes, you know, they're just like high production value. We have such a short amount of time, like, and budget, mm -hmm. you know, HBO. It's like barely any time or money to make this happen. So I think I realized it even more. Like as an actor, I'm still like, oh my God, how are we doing this? But when you're a director, it's like, oh my God, the minutes are just like rushing by and you're like, how do we accomplish this? I don't understand. Every day, crazy new set, crazy, you know, just a lot. And it made me really appreciate how much uh, Charles and SV do. I was just like, wow, you guys keep it so cool under you know such pressure. Um, but I'm really proud of the episode. I think it came together really well. I, I had a lot of ideas of like inspiration of Magnolia and stuff and just this kind of like 
upbeat kind of like feeling throughout the whole episode. And um, yeah, and I feel like it really transferred. But Claire really carries the episode, you know. Um, yeah. Chantal is such a wonderfully sad person. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you mentioned um, the, the guest stars this season. Um, obviously, the big one to me is Susan Sarandon. Um, and I was wondering if Charleston Sarvalli, you can talk a little bit about how you get someone like Susan Sarandon to do this show that has this is a very passionate cult following and, you know, has transferred networks and streaming services and all of that. And then, Cole, what your memories are from working with, you know, Susan Sarandon. Um. I don't really, she, she was in and out so fast. It was really, <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, you, uh, you talk, you talk first, Charles and SV, I'll talk the response while you're talking. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, there's some actors that are gets, um, that, Come, that we work really hard to try to make happen. And then there's some where it's like, oh my God, Ann Dowd's going to be in it. And it just like <laughs> clicks really effortlessly. So I think that the level that the show's at where it has a culty hit, but you know, outside of our demographic, maybe not everybody knows it. Um, you know, Susan, we are friends with uh, her son, Jack uh, Robbins. And Jack is a really talented filmmaker. Um, so we just already knew him and so we when we were thinking of who would be a great lila it was like that would be the susan sarandon would be the dream and so we talked to jack about it and i i don't know if it would have crossed her desk otherwise you know like i i think actors at that level you have no idea what's going on in their on their phone calls so you know that it was that was a situation where it was like okay we really want susan i wonder if we could make that happen um and then when she it was a it was amazing. Like she's the coolest person you've ever met in your life. And <laughs> everyone, everyone had a one-on-one -on -one, one relationship with her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially me. <okay>. Um, <clears throat> no, it was just, um, I think that's the word that everyone keeps using is how, how cool she is. And, um, yeah, every, everyone was just like, God, you're so cool <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> and, um, that's how I felt. Like, God, this, this lady's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, and you're playing a version of the character that she's playing. So mm -hmm. What like, do you, what was that like to, did you work with her at all on sort of marrying those her, two? I had things? her over many nights to sort of give her the, uh, I said, no, look, this is how I'm doing it. No, I, um, uh, like, oh, look. <laughs> uh, I, I sort of, um, just had to <laughs> let the the costume and the wig and the and our eyes do the work. Um, I I thought about maybe playing a version of her. I don't know. It was, but also I don't know if like we knew at that point whether or not she for sure was going to do it. Um, so yeah, we just sort of made it up. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, I remember, I mean, it feels like a million years ago at this point, but I got to, I was very lucky to go to the set of season three at the um, courthouse in the Bronx. And I, I got to talk to everyone about sort of where their characters had evolved. And there was this, I remember there was this whole conversation when the show had started in season one about how you're playing these millennial types, but you're sort of bringing more like nuance to them than the media generally likes to portray. And that was really refreshing to people to be able to see some likability and some, you know, depth to these millennial types. But then season three happened. And I remember talking to, you know, especially John Meredith and, and the other John and, and the other John especially was like, no, these people aren't likable. They, they have done really bad things. And that's sort of been a huge evolution that, you know, people were searching for ways to identify and relate to these characters, but now, we've realized that they are sort of irredeemable people. But in season four, I would, I would argue, especially as we watched, just watched that um, season finale and saw those really heartfelt speeches that they were giving at the, the what was the, the funeral for, for Dory and sort of the, the way they threw themselves in this mission to, to, to find Dory. I would argue maybe there is some re redeemability coming back. And I'm curious what, um, what John, Meredith and, and Alia think about sort of where these characters have 
gone in terms of that millennial type and and the redeemability and likability of these characters after all that they've done. Well, I think all people are nuanced, whether they're likable or not. And I think like, not to be like, that's a woman in film, but like, you know, there is this emphasis on likability all the time and trying to be likable and this and that. And then the second that I just, especially with this character, I actually released all caring about, is she likable, is she not likable? Who cares? It's just even the most hateable people in certain private moments you feel you feel empathy for, you feel um, that. So I think it's filled with all the colors of people that do horrible things in one moment and someone that can be heartbreaking in another. That's, it's the great writing, it's the stakes, it's the story, it's all of that. But allowing, you know, I would, I want to see all, everybody on the show really does create these nuanced characters, but it's, it's because, you know, we get to see them in all these different stages of their, you know, evolution. And it's like, I, I just think about it all the time. I just, there are people that you see out in the world and you're like, you're a terrible person, but I'm sure you'd see them five minutes later with their kids or the cat or something and be like, I really love them. So I think play this show plays with the, that grayness of like morality and what is likable and playing with that through the lens of like you were saying, this depiction of millennials um, is very fulfilling. I don't know, I love it. Thank you for including cats. Yeah, you're welcome. I do want to cats. Um, cats. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Um... I also feel like in regards to the millennial question, I, we get it like a lot of people talk about it being like a millennial show, but um, I don't know, we haven't really talked about like it being a millennial show. I think it's just inherently a millennial show because the cast and the creators are all millennials. And I also feel like in the media, like everyone's been trained to just like hate millennials and blame them for a bunch of shit. So I also feel like when you describe it, it's like, it's a show about millennials. Everyone's like, I hate, I hate them. I hate millennials. That's like already like built in to sort of hate these characters. And then on top of that, like they murder someone and cover it up. <laughs> but like, I think that's the thing you should hate about them. Not that they like grew up with AOL. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, it, start to finish seeing where Drew has gone. It's like crazy and fun to continue to play like a more broken person season to season and season and then see him in this season try to fully regress and and retreat in himself and become that like little good boy again was really fun and that like his little born again moment wasn't to christ but instead to like a disneyland adjacent place uh, i thought was so funny to me so uh and that's it for me kevin thanks <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Uh, so I want to ask really quick before we run out of time about that great season finale that everyone just got to watch. You know, it certainly takes the audience on a ride um, up until that very last moment, that very last gasp for breath. Um, you know, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, where that might leave us in terms of where the show might be moving forward and, and what, what an audience that's been following this journey for four seasons my takeaway from, you know, having the opportunity to watch that whole funeral sequence, but then realize that there's actually more to it than, you know, that might have seemed. Yeah, we, I mean, the, there's no season five confirmed. So, you know, you can't ask that if you're trying. <laughs> I can will um, it into the universe. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think the idea that we like in that kind of cliffhanger energy is that, you know, that there would be a lot of story to tell on the other side of having survived death. Um, and so, you know, we really wanted the finale to feel like you really did believe Dory was dead. So that when you do get that moment at the very end, the actual weight of that possibility has like sunk in. Um, so, you know, there's interesting ideas to mine on the other side of having had a, a white light moment in death. And now she's paid the price for the murders, so you can do whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> I'm likable again. You know? Yeah, you're likable again because you suffered. And, uh, yeah. It's gonna be like a sitcom. It'll be like Friends now. 
<laughs> Allie McBeal, make, please. Make them likable. Make them likable. <laughs> All right, well, um, we're out of time, but I wanted to thank all of you for, for chatting with us and, and thank HBO Max and, and Newfest for, for hosting this panel. Um, and as a reminder, all four seasons of Search Party are now available on HBO Max, so please binge away. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye.